Hello, everyone. Welcome. We have a great group of people joining us for our uh, 3 and 30 celebrating Black History Month. So thank you for being one of those people and being here. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator for the VMFA. Uh, and I get, have the delight of working with people like our presenter today to present um, this monthly gallery program called 3 and 30. That means we'll talk about three objects in the permanent collection in roughly 30 minutes, except Alexis here has the added, uh, added challenge of doing it in 20 minutes so that you have time to uh, submit your questions to her. But Alexis Assam is our presenter today, and she will be speaking on Black artists of the modern and contemporary collection of the VMFA. Alexis is one of the newest hires in our curatorial department. She's the Regina A. Perry Assistant Curator of Global Contemporary Art, and we are thrilled to have her. So with that, Alexis, I will turn it over to you and come back for Q&A. All right. Well, uh, Izzy, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And good morning, everyone, and happy Black History Month. Um, today, I will be talking with all of you about three works by Black artists in our 21st century galleries. And I will be highlighting materiality and surface decoration of work by Nick Cave, Elias C. May, and Micheline Thomas. Um, all three of these works were created in the 2010s, and all three are rooted in the history of abstraction. So within the works of these artists, we're looking at how they enhance the surface of the canvas, thinking outside of the box of traditional painting and sculpture, um, experimenting with materials and processes in the studio, um, rather than sticking to particular modes of abstraction. They are really creating hybrid works that combine techniques barred from painting, drawing, collage, sculpture, and other mediums. And um, this constant experimentation remains a critical driving force for these artists' creative approaches. Um, and I'm gonna start first with this sound suit by Nick Cave. Um, it is the first object you see when you walk into our 21st century galleries. Um, and he is a multidisciplinary artist born in Fulton, Mississippi. Um, Cave studied art at the Kansas City Art Institute concentrating in fiber and design in 1982. And after graduation, he went and studied dance and choreography um, with the Alvin Ailey Academy. And he worked for many years traveling and performing with them um, until leaving to do graduate studies at the Cranbrook Art Institute in 1989. So here we see a detail of this very elaborately decorated sculpture full of embroidery and sequins. And Nick Cave is best known for his sound suits of which he's made hundreds throughout his career. And despite the beauty of this object on first look, um, Nick Cave describes them as coming from a dark place, as a way to hide race, to hide gender, to hide class, one's whole identity um, as a form of protection. So sound suits are wearable sculptures that the artist began making in 1992 as a response to the televised beating of Rodney King by Los Angeles police. So here is a quote from the artist detailing his very personal reaction to the Rodney King beating that prompted this sculpture series, um, which now makes up well over 500 sculptures. So he said, quote, it was an almost inflammatory response. We're calling news coverage of King's beating on television in 1991, an acquittal of the police in 1992 led to an outbreak of riots. I felt like my identity and who I was as a human being was up for question. I felt like that could have been me. Once that incident occurred, I was existing very differently in the world. So many things were going through my head. How do I exist in a place that sees me as a threat? I started thinking about the role I have identity, being racially profiled, feeling devalued, less than, dismissed. And then I happened to be in the park this one particular day and I looked down at the ground and there was a twig. And I just thought, well, that's discarded and it's sort of insignificant. And so I just started then gathering the twigs. And before I knew it, I had built a sculpture. So the name sound suit comes from the rustling sound made by the wooden sticks and twigs that the artist collected in this first iteration of these sculptures. Um, many of the early sound suits were made of these twigs um, and that's evident in this image here. Um, and this is an example from the Smart Museum of Art. So 
Nick Cave's introduction to fabric art began with his customization of hand-me-down clothing during his childhood. He was the youngest of about seven siblings and his interest um, followed him into his artistic practice. So here we are looking at this sculpture as a static object. It is just in the gallery, um, standing there, unmoving. And as a former dancer and choreographer, Cave has historically activated these objects. Um, so if they're static or they're in motion, um, the sound suit um, pieces really bear resemblance to African ceremonial costumes and masks. And kind of evidence of this West African influence uh, is seen in Nick Cave's work, but also across um, the African diaspora. If you look to Mardi Gras, New Orleans, to celebrations like Junkanoo and Carnival across the Caribbean and Latin America, um, there's a similar kind of energy that all of the costumes for these celebrations um, evoke. And um, he has traditionally uh, worn them and performed in them to really activate this energy that's held within them. Um, and so even though um, they hold this dark truth um, that really prompted the series, um, they also have hold a very beautiful history of ritual and dance um, in all of the other kind of traditions that they uh, evoke. So here is a more expanded view of one side of the gallery where you can see this sculpture and also the next object um, I'm going to discuss. So Elias Sime uh, was born in the capital of Ethiopia where he continues to live and work. And in 1990, he studied graphic art from the School of Fine Arts and Design at Addis Ababa University. Um, titled Tightrope Continuous Rotation Severos, um, in Amharic, the language spoken in Ethiopia, tightrope literally means a rope that is stretched and stressed. And so this work and his overall body of work um, comment on the transformation of the capital city of Ethiopia, which is Addis Ababa. And in his series, Tightrope, um, the title refers to the precarious balance between the advancements that technology have made possible and their detrimental impact on the environment. So again, bringing materiality to the center of this conversation, um, he's really bringing light to the resilience of nature, to social responsibility, to the beauty of the utilitarian. Um, and this work is a part of a larger series of about two dozen works that uh, were in a large show that traveled in two, 2020 and 2021 to four museums um, and this is you know, one of that larger series that we are very happy to have in our collection. So Sime sources his supplies from the Mercato in Adidas Ababa, Ethiopia, which is the largest open air market in Africa. And these are two example images of some parts of the market. Um, and it is home to one of the world's largest repositories of computer refuse. So he sometimes waits years to accumulate a significant amount of an item. So that could be um, computer parts, electronic wires, um, you know, all of these different parts of electronics that have been thrown away from the larger global world. Um, many of them end up at this market. Um, so the picture on the right um, shows you like all of these plastic bottles and uh, imagine all kinds of electrical parts kind of in a big mound of reselling in the market. And that's kind of um, where he's getting these supplies. So he has to, like I said, wait years sometimes to get a particular object that he's really thinking about using um, in his artwork. And he breaks them down, he weaves them, he collages them, burns the materials, um, before he affixes them to these panels um, that he then puts together into large assemblages um, to create the final work. And transforming an object that people around the world put into trash, into fine art, creates a really beautiful um, landscape of um, these objects. And the concept of recycling and sustainability are large global issues that he is now addressing through his work and his constant repurposing. Um, but instead of, you know, kind of thinking it as a one-to-one, -one, you know, reusing, recycling, uh, he's also really thinking of it uh, as a way of putting forth the resiliency and creativity of the city 
uh, and the country in transition and the creativity um, throughout his own work. So here are some detailed shots of um, the same larger image we looked at when we first started talking about Sime. Um, his work um, references both Western art history and traditional Ethiopian textiles and architecture. Um, he's using local techniques uh, usually used for weaving fibers to weave wires. And you see these um, details here of these braided and woven wires that are then tacked on with nails um, in these really glorious colors. And it really kind of really, it makes you think about um, the real diversity of these objects. Um, when I think of computer parts and wires and electronics, I'm not necessarily thinking about the beauty of these colors, but here um, when put in focus uh, really brings to mind um, the beauty in the simple and everyday uh, object that we use. So he's really interested in how these objects are reclaimed and given a new life in art. So when you look at the larger image, Sime has constructed an entirely new landscape with these materials. And um, if you look to the bottom of the canvas, it really looks like he's created a mound and it also kind of makes you think of a, a new landscape that he's created, maybe an interpretation of the market, possibly an interpretation of where he sources um, the materials. And by transforming the discarded objects into the extraordinary, Sime allows us to see these objects in completely new and different ways. So we are now going to move on to the work of Micheline Thomas, um, our final artist for 3 and 30 this morning. So she was born in Camden, New Jersey and lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and she makes paintings, collages, photography, video, and installations, very multidisciplinary, um, much like Nick Cave, much like a lot of these artists um, who are really experimenting um, with the types uh, of artwork that they can create. And she truly draws on art history and popular culture to create a contemporary vision of female sexuality, beauty, and power. And she received her BFA from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and her MFA from Yale. Thomas's dialogue with art history is evident in this painting, which unusually for her presents a setting without the figure. Um, and this uh, rich um, play of patterns uh, of the image really calls to mind Henri Matisse's paintings, um, while the illusion of torn and pasted fragments really recall uh, Romare Bearden's collages. So here is an example um, in our collection of a Romare Bearden collage. And the flat perspective and collage elements uh, really especially highlight the bright orange interruptions that she includes um, and really show uh, the influence of artists like Bearden and artists like Matisse in her uh, larger work. So her use of materials is another historical reference to women making art. Um, acrylic paint uh, is usually much cheaper than oil paint, along with items that are more aligned with craft. And when she was in school um, studying as an artist, she gravitated toward these non-traditional materials so that she continued creating. So going to Michael's craft store um, for felt, for fabric, for rhinestones, for glitter, um, which were more affordable than things like oil and acrylic paint, um, things that one might uh, see in craft and outsider art and associate more with those disciplines, um, she has put at the forefront of her artistic practice. Um, so at a time when she couldn't afford these materials, not limiting herself, um, but using what was accessible in her environment. And what I really love about um, the art that she continues to make today, she of course has a very fantastic career. She continues to use these materials that she once used more so um, due to the price point and now has completely centered them um, and they've been very important um, within her own overall artistic practice. So she is really best known for exploring traditional notions of femininity and beauty, um, as well as female empowerment through paintings portraying provocative, glamorous African-American women. 
So she draws inspiration from multiple artistic periods and cultural influences throughout Western art history, uh, particularly the early modernists, um, such as Aang, such as Pablo Picasso, Matisse, Manet. Um, and that is what we have in this example here. This is her take on Luncheon of the Grass uh, by Manet and a very um, bright and colorful uh, reworking of the object um, in her own style, foregrounding the beauty um, of the black woman, foregrounding the interior space of the black woman um, and these you know, collage elements um, and glitter and rhinestones that really adorn um, this fantastic canvas. And she models her figures on these classic poses and abstract settings popularized by modern masters as a way to reclaim agency for women who have presented as objects to be desired and subjugated. And here she puts them at the forefront, really putting forth their own agency and not as um, diminutive subjects. So back to the work in our collection, um, to create these works, she has a three-part process. So first she actually builds sets um, that are reminiscent of 1970s domestic interiors. Um, and then she poses and photographs her model. And then finally she paints the image on a much larger scale and then incorporating um, these really beautiful um, elements on top of them. And so she draws from a number of time periods um, so using pattern and domestic spaces, um, not only of the 1970s, but 1960s through the 1980s, um, this was a time of immense social and political conflict, um, change and transformation. And the civil rights movement, the Black is Beautiful movement, second wave feminism, um, all of which many uh, Black and African-American women were rejected and they were redefining their own traditional standards of beauty amidst all of this social change and um, forward movement um, in America and beyond. So here is an overall view of the painting um, in the 21st century galleries. So this theme of using unconventional materials and techniques on canvas um, and across media is not limited to our 21st century galleries um, and the images that I showed you today are within those two spaces, um, but is also found on the other side of the floor um, in our 20th century galleries. And so um, last year, my department of modern contemporary art put up a rotation called about the pattern and decoration movement, um, which is primarily made up of women and puts women's work at the forefront of their painting with patterns, with fabric um, and, a variety of materials that are definitely thought of as unconventional, such as using um, cake decorating tools to apply paint. Um, and to complement the pattern and decoration movement, we just installed the uh, image here, which is a video um, by Jamaican artist, Ebony Patterson, um, called Three Kings Weep. And I encourage you um, when you come and visit the museum to come and visit our 21st century galleries to go uh, across um, the floor to the 20th century galleries check out the pattern and decoration rotation, um, check out this fantastic video by Emily Patterson, Three Kings Weep, and Valerie Cassell Oliver, who is the head of the Modern and Contemporary Department, will be doing an upcoming program about this work and detailing its importance, detailing the kind of unconventional materials that she uses um, and really the, the meat of this work. So I hope you all enjoyed this presentation, this quick three and 30 uh, to really get you all into the mindset uh, of the kinds of fantastic artists we have on view in the gallery and to kick off Black History Month with these uh, fantastic work by Black artists. So I am now open to any questions uh, you may have. Thank you so much, Alexis. That was wonderful. Um, I did want to just, uh, share with everybody that program that Alexis mentioned that uh, Valerie will be a part of is our annual African American read in. And that happens every February, we invite community members to read poems by uh, black 
uh, poets, authors, speech writers, and our curators select those readings. So Valerie will be paired with a community member who will be reading a um, poem that's actually very directly related to that uh, to that artwork. But um, if you are interested in learning more about it and to hear some literature, um, please uh, think about joining us for that event. It is virtual, free, just requires registration. I uh, dropped that link in um, the chat menu. So, but back to um, our topic at hand, Alexis, we do have a question about the Cime first. Oh, um, fantastic. Uh, does Cime do all his own weaving of the wires or does he have assistance like many artists do? Oh, this is also a question that came up on Tuesday and I, I can't speak to that specifically. I'm not sure um, if he does uh, all of the work on his own or if he has a larger studio that help him. Um, it would make sense if he does. That is, you know, definitely a tradition in art history um, with, you know, masters that um, have assistants that create the work. But for him specifically, I'm not sure. I'd have to look more into it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what I really saw as a through line for your from your talk was this idea of um, found materials, you know, mm -hmm. Nick Cave with the twigs, Sime with the repurposed objects from flea markets, Micheline Thomas with what she could get from the stores. Um, there's a really um, creative intent with uh, this material work. Um, so that was really fascinating to me. Uh, another question that came through has to do with the Nick Cave, um, and specifically, I think we're speaking to um, how it's activated. You mentioned yeah. that he was a performer, um, and you, you showed this other suit. Are they ever shown together, or are all the suits kind of um, the same when they're performed? Could you speak a little to that? Sure. So, yes, they're often presented together. He's had many exhibitions that are all about the sound suits. Um, and displaying the variety um, within this very large and ongoing series that he's creating. Um, and in terms of wearing them and activating them, so if you look, um, you know, there's uh, an under kind of garment with these like uh, part where your feet would go in, kind of like a sock stocking situation. Um, and then this over piece that goes over your head and your whole body arms and everything. So they, I'm sure they are quite restrictive um, and you can't see out of them. So you would really need to be in a space you are comfortable and familiar with um, to perform them. But yes, um, he has definitely worn many of them. I'm sure not all of them are created to be performed in, um, but those that are, he is able to wear them and move enough in them to kind of do um, uh, dance and performance. And he choreographs those dances as well, correct? Yes, I believe so. Interesting. Uh, and just a, a follow up, how many sound suits do you think he has made? I know that's probably a hard thing to know I think the it's, exact number. I think it's like over 500. I've uh, seen in wow. multiple sources that it's over 500 and I believe he's still making them. So it's a like constant and continuous. That's um, amazing. The, the level of detail to create these and, and to have them be functional. I mean, yeah. as you pointed out, they aren't um, necessarily meant to be in a museum. They're meant to be activated and uh, and they have to be sturdy too. <laughs> uh, and sort of a, a related question, would, would you be able to guess how long it takes to make one of these? Oh, I, I really, I didn't delve into the amount of time it takes to construct. I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> but I'm sure it is a very intensive and laborious process to create um, something with this intricate detail. And I think something that relates back to the CMA that we were talking about, possibly he has um, a studio as well that is helping yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, and especially because he has this background in fashion and textile design, um, you know, something that we also know of with the old masters and having their artist studios is that fashion houses also have their studios with their multiple assistants working. So um, I'm not sure how much that has influenced his production uh, of creating these artworks, but that's definitely something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Alexis. You've given us so much to think about and hopefully some works to uh, come view in person uh, when you um, would like. Uh, with that, Alexis, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge today. This was wonderful. Thank you all. And this was really wonderful and happy Black History Month. Yes. Happy Black History Month, everyone. See everyone soon.